So, wait. Yeah. Let's do this. Is this okay? <laughs> oh, shoot. I gotta acknowledge one thing. I feel awkward because it's been quite some time since I actually been to San Jose State. Last time I was here was the spring 20. March happened and then I moved out. Um, I'm gonna put this here. So for, so for some of you, you know, as you know, apparently AJ roast me. Thank you very much. My name is Eder Samudio. I am a third year grad student in the anthropology department. I'm about to graduate, so yes, finally. <laughs> God, the pandemic just made it worse. Being a grad student is very draining, but doing everything virtual is even more, right? And some of you guys who teach probably heard this from your students. Um, now, bear with me with the title. I still, I haven't finished it, so I'm not gonna present it like this, but as of right now, this is what I have. Apply anthropology in the service of undocumented students, right, during the pandemic at San Jose State University. Now, I might change that. Now, I should, I should give you some context of what actually happened with this. Initially, this was not my first project. So as those of you who will be first years, in a few months rather than the fall, you might have a different idea of what you wanna do, right? But I expect that to change a little bit because you also have to manage, well, how many classes are you taking? Do you have debt? Do you have other family responsibilities, right? And anything else that you don't wanna share. Um, and this was about mid-fall 19. Those of you who have taken Professor Spass theory class under 200, right? Um, you know, just when you think that you have produced a good job, right? Like, oh, you're happy. It's like, oh, he's gonna say something good. He turns the paper back. This is like a 10 page paper, 10 sources. His pages are like 20 comments long. <laughs> he literally corrected my name. I'm like, how do you correct my name? <laughs> but he means well, those are his high standards and that's what we need, right? But he also, his sense of humor is like that, so he gets it. Um, so, you know, you come a little down because you, I literally felt like, dude, I should probably take an ESL class because this fool just corrected my name, right? So as I'm getting, <laughs> I'm very informal. So as I am getting, <laughs> as I'm getting out, um, I'm just walking towards, uh, I don't know, San Jose State, I'm just going towards the gym, and I bumped into an old, co an old colleague, Ana Navarrete. We met in Santa Cruz back in 2014, some time ago. Now she's working as the director of Andoki Spartan. And I was like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in a long time. And she's like, oh my God, Eder, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, I'm a grad student here at this department. And she's like, well, I need some help with my programming in the Undocumented Resource Center. So for those of you who will be the first year, partnerships just emerge sometimes, all of a sudden, with people on campus or off campus. And that's what you guys have to determine down the road with your advisor. Um, so that's some context how this emerge. So just go with it, right? Now, since I'm pretty much speaking of undocumented students and some of you might know or others not know at all, right? I'm giving you three images to describe, understand what is the discourse or how this discourse has developed here in the US, just the US. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, um, a lot of people complain that we don't pay taxes. A lot of people complain that we're taking the job of hardworking Americans while also being lazy and not doing anything. It's very confusing, you can be both. Pick one, God, pick one, right? Now, at the same time, you have a counter narrative that centers on documentary students as being part of the US. If you haven't seen this film uh, by Jose Antonio Vargas, um, he's one activist, a famous undocumented student who actually is local, he's from the Bay Area, I believe Redwood City, who couldn't go to college because he didn't know he had papers. More like his, his social security number was not a genuine one. He didn't know this. So his, his whole story narrates how he tries to navigate college, but also trying to find a job post-graduation. So, but that is one particular narrative that centers undocumented students as being part of the US, as maybe being only monolingual, as having one political allegiance, as not knowing anything from other country and just being very American, whatever that means. <laughs> Nowadays, actually, you have a counter narrative to that one and the previous one. And that book actually is one of the authors I have met, Lacey Abrego, with others. Now they're saying, okay, well, not all AB540 students, right, have to have a 4.0 GPA. Not all of them have to be valedictorian. Not all of them have to go to elite colleges, right? Some of us are brown. Some of us are queer. Some of us have been in prison. 
So it adds that other part of the experience of what is to be undocumented. You don't portray the cute little things that you do. You portray the whole thing, right? So there's three ongoing discourses, right? I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of it. You know, I don't want to go into it because there's a lot to unpack. Um, okay. So let me explain this. So in addition to this partnership being with Anna, right? We sat down and we just got chat, like, how have you been? But of course, as you speak with your partners, your directors, managers, whatever you may have, you reflect and it's like, how do we make it through college not having papers, right? But what does it mean to be undocumented in the US? Like, what does that really mean in papers, in like material things, right? So I'm giving you some general trends. So the first one, right? You don't get federal assistance. Some of you guys who are right now undergrads might look at your financial aid award. You get a Cal grant, A or B, C, whatever the GPA is. You also get a Pell grant, and then you might get a state grant. If you're undocumented, pre-DACA, pre-DACA, you don't get anything. If you don't fill the correct forms, you will pay us out of the state. If you, if you fill and qualify for the AB 540 form, you will pay us an it's in-state resident tuition, right? Pell grant is about seven, six to seven thousand dollars. That's a lot of help. Pell grant is about ten k, depending on your GPA. So yeah, you know we don't get anything nowadays. We at least get um, the California Dream Act allows allow us undocumented students to get the uh, Pell grant. Now, limited scholarships, internships, and opportunities. Well, some of the scholarships might ask you to have U.S. citizenship or at least legal residency. Well, that's one obstacle. Now, in some cases, high school and college staff might be unfamiliar with this because they don't know how to deal with undocumented students or they don't know how to address their issues. I was lucky enough that I was living in TPS, San Francisco. My counselor spoke Spanish and she asked me, what do you want to do? Go to college. You have papers? No. Just go to city college and then you'll transfer out. But that was my counselor. Anna's counselor didn't tell her that. She told her, I think he told her to just graduate barely. So it's gonna be very subjective, but not every counselor is trained to deal with undocumented students. That's one example. Um, fear of deportation. Okay, uh, how do I explain that one in, in plain English? Just assume that at any point, at any time, someone is gonna call the cops on you and they're gonna take you to jail. And then they're gonna deport you out of this country. That is a constant sense of fear. This is even worse in cities that, what's the word, are not that liberal. I'm just gonna leave it like that. Now, a stigma around being undocumented. Well, if you place attention to the media, the media also portrays undocumented migrants as coming to the, crossing the border, stealing jobs, drugs. That makes you feel bad. That makes you feel like you don't belong to this country, even though this is the only country you know in the whole, in your whole life, right? So there's a stigma about it. Lack of support networks. Well, your parents might not believe that you are college material. You don't have good high school or college professors. So you're not able to develop, develop those support networks in the long run, right? So you're against that. Now, city of residence. That I mean that depending on the city that you live in, you might have access to certain resources. If you live in San Francisco, oh my God, there is so much free money flowing there. That's how I was able to pay, I was able to pay all my college education because I just applied to a bunch of scholarships in San Francisco. I don't think that's a semi-molesto or other cities. Right, again, city of residency matters a lot. Now, fa uh, family responsibilities. This is, um, undocumented students might fall or might overlap with this category of students, first generation low income students. They might overlap because first generation low income student might be defined as being the first one in your family, right, going to a four year college in the US. Undocumented students might come from a similar background. Now, how each nonprofit or organization takes a definition, that's a different conversation. I'm just saying a general one. So, as undocumented youth or first generation working with students go to college, we keep working and we keep giving our checks to our families. This does not stop even post graduation, that keeps going. That's a side note for grad students in that. Now, and this is just to California since, well, San Jose State is here, right? Just some of the benefits that we, well, that undocumented students have, the AB 540 form that allows you to pay in-state tuition if you qualify, and also that has some variance too. We have access to the California Dream Act, which is Cal Grant A and B, you know, simple words. And then we have a lot of scholarships and nonprofit organizations. 
If you're living in the Bay Area, you might be familiar with the Silicon Community Valley Foundation, huge nonprofit, a lot of cash, and a lot of scholarships that don't require citizenship. So, oh God, thank you, California. Um, so, just to give you some context about Andoki Spartan, right? It is fairly new. It opened in 2018. Um, I get that number of 600 through the director because there is not an official way to keep track of undocumented students in San Jose. It's mostly when they are incoming students and they want to check and they check the box. I would like to get more resources about undocumented services, uh, you know, support, anything like that. And that's how they were tracking those numbers. So that number might be actually higher and that might include actually um, undergrads and grad students, mostly undergrads. Oh my God, and of course this was the, um, I believe the professor Julia Curry in the Chicano Chicano Studies Department one of, was one of the key players in trying to advocate, in advocating for the center to open up. And then of course, one of the things that they do is they provide legal and financial assistance. So like that's the core of it. Oh God, now we're gonna go into the good part. Ah, wait. Ah, so <laughs> this took place on a spring, um, I need to correct that, it was actually spring 21, so a year ago, in the middle of a pandemic. So everything was virtual for the most part. Now, there was two ways in which I decided to collect data. I was a mentor for the four uh, student interns from the center, and I was also collecting interviews, semi-structured interviews with the students. Okay, so that's good. Um, and of course, I signed to be there uh, for the student interns, I was their mentor the whole term but I never set up boundaries of like, when is a good time to call me or not? So they will like call me or text me very late on the night too. I'm like, oof. <laughs> so, because that is part of being a mentor, especially for low income first generation students on top of, you know, documented, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course, I was like, okay. So with Anna, it's like we, you, uh, at the point of it, right, is that USRC it was providing excellent resources for students, right? Legal assistance, right? If they have questions about their DACA or missing status families, fee, um, financial assistance if you want to renew your DACA, great. But what else, right? How can I develop, how can I be a service of you to develop a program that engages the students, right, and connects them to the campus so they feel part of San Jose State? So this is why I decided to pilot a mentoring program and design the metrics for it too. So I was like, how do I design the metrics for this? I, I've never been on a mentoring program. I, 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 that was new to me. Um, and then of course, right, everything was online during the pandemic. So that's, that was a challenge. How do you become engaged? So as you guys in your first year come to terms to what your partner is going to be, you need, to, you need some deliverables, some like, what is, what is the outcome of this partnership, right? I had a bunch of them, as you can tell. I mean, as I previously mentioned, I had to design the mentoring program, but then I also had to design the training models for these future peer mentors, because you just don't design the metrics, what they're gonna do, how do you train them? Because not every student has those capacities. Some of them might, others won't, right? And then I was like, ah, Anna, like, we need to become more involved in Instagram or YouTube, right? And that's another um, deliverable that came from this. Let's have discussions online, not just between us, right? But also with um, the Chicano Studies, the, the Chicano Resource Center, and also with Andoki Professionals, who is a nonprofit by Shari Garcia, who is a key player, ooh, a key player out there. And then of course, I told Anna, look, let me look for scholarships and internships that undocumented students can apply for. Let's have that database, because you're gonna need that. And as we're like old, we already know the game, they don't. And nowadays there is DACA. When we were undergrads, there was no DACA. So it was very specific. So yeah, this, um, and the online engagement kind of emerged as I reported back to Anna, because I was mentoring and I was also collecting interviews. So that's something that emerged. Oh, Dios mío. Um, now, I'm gonna share a little bit of what I found. Now, there was a common um, sentiment. Those students who went to USRC before the pandemic actually were able to meet Anna and engage with her. So I actually had the, um, printed the paper because I wanted to read uh, one of the students' statements and I actually like it. Uh, let me see. Luis, a senior major in business administration said, um, that USRC represented us and our students are struggling at San Jose State. The center makes me feel that we matter, a specific place that we can rely on 
get legal services, and that has competent resources for students, especially at the beginning, because we can ask questions to Anna and get direction and guidance. So that was one common thing. Those who went there actually felt that they belonged there, not to the whole state, to the center. Those are, that's a different, that's a distinction. But again, again, Luis was a senior, so he was about to graduate. But I also encountered students who began um, as freshmen in the pandemic. And that's what their perception was just very different. Uh, Victoria, a transfer student, majoring in liberal studies, she said, I get information through USRC, the Instagram page about the scholarships, deadlines, projects like yours, events are happening. I can see them and read them instantly, nothing else. So it was just about information. She didn't feel that um, the USRC was engaging with her. Here it is, take it. But again, this is the pandemic, right? She never came here, she stayed home. So there was a distinction. So that was like, whoa. I was like, I get it. I didn't, I didn't complete grad school you know, in person, so I kind of get a little bit of that. Now, I also ask students, what do you think about mentoring? Like, what does that mean to you? Because I don't want to assume, right? Like, they, might have, they probably went to Abbott. They probably were Puente students, right? I have no idea. So, <laughs> and these conversations, right, all of them were kind of like Spanish and English or Spanglish. I mean, as you can tell, I speak two languages by now. Um, confianza came as a common term, a symbol of trust because mentors follow through those commitments, right? Um, I have actually, <laughs> see. Alicia, sophomore major in child development. A person who, have, who you have confianza that keeps you on track, who keeps it real, a person who is always there for the academic and the personal, right? So it's, just, it's not just about giving information, it's about actually engaging with the person and making a trustful relationship, right? I was like, yeah. I get that, that's my mentor right now. Now, the last one. That actually is very interesting because it was very contingent on the, I don't wanna say the student's major, but also the way the, the personalities were. I had one student, for example, uh, who said, I am not too sure, I have not been there, I always see the post and I don't really know much about it, Maybe every month or monthly meeting, right, where we can meet other undocumented students, just socialize. When I ask that question, what do you wanna see from the center coming up, like to engage you? They were like, well, I don't know much. I would like to meet others. Okay, so that's how you see yourself as being part of San Jose State, being part of the center. You need to socialize with others, makes sense. Now, that was the easy response. The longer response from another student was, Help with jobs, connected with internships, jobs in the area for transfers, helping hand, scholarships, guidance to find resources, more information, it just goes on like that. Because she saw that belonging, right, to San Jose State or the center wasn't just about gathering, it was like, give me information, I want a major, I want jobs, so she's also a transfer student from another city. So it was very, diff very different experiences. I was like, oh, okay. So your concept of belonging is rooted in professional development, academic guidance, mental health, scholarships, jobs. Makes sense. That's how they perceive belonging to the institution. Oh, no. Oof, Dios mio. Okay, so as I'm gathering the data, as I'm like talking to the interns, I see the three things, right, that I think a mentoring program can be, oh, can be about, right? The first one is community building. So a future peer mentor will focus on these three pillars of support. A future, and also I told Anna, look, if you're gonna have a mentoring program, you better have only like a group of five to seven undergrads to one peer mentor, an upperclassman. You match the upperclassmen with a lower classmate, that's five to seven students. That should be enough to keep your sanity, but also make you work, right? Especially because mentors are also not limited all the time. They're more flexible. Now, community building referred to guiding the, guiding the newcomers into going to their academic advisors, getting an academic plan, finding relevant resources on campus, that kind of things that connects you to people on campus. Financial awareness, you're gonna go with your future, future peer mentor, right, to the financial aid office because we do have a referral, a, re a representative there. You're gonna find scholarships and things like that. You know, so you become financially savvy, develop a budget, anything to help you out with money-wise. Now, the last one is more, um, hands off, but I wouldn't say hands off, I will I kind of roll it in that section that future peer mentors should um, 
advocate for students or suggest to them or teach them that they can use the resources here. They need to go to the career center here and develop those connections. Work on your LinkedIn profile because nowadays LinkedIn is your cover letter to the whole freaking world <laughs> and things like that. Every pillar has about four to seven activities and it's for the whole year. So in one year, you should be, through this program, be adept to being part of San Jose State, right? And again, it was like how I was thinking about the whole situation. Oh, so for online engagement, I was like, okay, how do we go online? So we were able to, um, how do I say this? We had, um, we won. I'm grateful that actually not all the interns were on, on point for this because they also were like, yeah, let's have this online engagement. It wasn't just Anna and my decision. They also agreed to this because their voices are here. So if you go to their Instagram page or their YouTube page, you're gonna see all the stuff that we talk about. My face is there, not allowed to be public in general. Um, and all of this, and also um, all of this is part of my project too because I was like, as an anthropologist, I have to adapt as, and I have to see and just like bring up new ideas. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this online engagement later on. Now, I was like, okay, the online engagement, the metrics for the mentoring program, now I have to think of the workshops. Like, what the heck am I, um, what the heck would Anna have? Like, so I need to create something that Anna can easily teach to these future peer mentors, right? Because again, I don't wanna assume that all those who will be mentors know what to do. And also you're dealing with undocumented students, which is a very specific population. The first one is, well, this workshop is about how do you mentor in general? What is their importance in first generation low income students and also being undocumented? Like what is the main point of a mentor, right? At the same time, there is a model about immigration status. What is the discourse of that and how is that present on the lives of people? So far, so good. Now, the, the um, intersectionality is connected um, because Anna and I also thought, well, even though Latinos get placed on the discourse as being illegal or undocumented, that's not a Latino issue. That's an everyone issue, especially for undocumented students who come from other countries. I mean, I'm Peruvian and I was, I didn't have papers, but apparently I was Mexican for some time, so <laughs> thank you, media. Um, and, the, <laughs> and the last workshop is about professional development, right? How do you help your students think about the post-job experience, developing those skills that they want, and also talking to them, like, what do you want to do long-term? So do they need to go to grad school, like we are, or do they don't? Things like that, right? And I told Anna, look, this is yours. You can add another workshop. You can edit this workshop. But I think this is a good base. And she's like, yeah, it's a good base. Um, now, this is more like the reflection, the update. Unfortunately, Anna hasn't been able to um, deploy this program. And this is because lack of funding. And that's one of my takeaways from this whole lesson. You can do as much as you want. But if you're an institution like this, you know money takes forever, which delays program implementation. But I've noticed also that she's been more active on her um, live Instagrams. So I'm like, okay, so you took some of my suggestions and you're actually applying them. I'm like, yes, yes. Um, now, I do wanna make a little note into regards to COVID. Um, there were some comments about like, I, I also asked like, so how has COVID changed your life? Because they're undergrads and I'm a grad student. For me, it's different. I just do my thing, I get out. They're supposed to be embedded here. This is their experience, not mine. They, the seniors felt that their experience was rough, that they lost it. They were working so hard for it. And I'm like, what am I gonna graduate now? Online university? Mm -hmm. They were not happy. But also, they didn't know where the boundaries of home, work, and school began and ended. Everything happened in their living quarters. I felt the same too, right? But for them it was worse. So I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, I don't know where to start and, and things like that. And for those who didn't, you know, who do, for those who began online, they never felt like they began college. They never left their houses. They literally went from seniors to junior, uh, from seniors to being first freshmen in college. For them, it's like, I don't feel any different. My mom is still yelling at me. I'm like, yeah, I know. I can hear your mom in the background. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, that was like how my project is going so far, almost done. And I just want to thank uh, William Rickmayer and Mrs. John Rickmayer. Thank you, faculty, for all your hard work. Thank you, AJ, for grilling me until the bitter end, um, <laughs> and thank you to the director and the interns as well. Oh, it was me. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> I 
think maybe uh, be, uh, be, before we, we wrap up the program, I, I think maybe we have one question for for Elder. Um, yeah, we do have time. Let me just ask others because I know Ed, others work very well. But um, yeah. if anyone has a question or maybe two brief ones, we can uh, squeeze those in before we're out of time. Quick question for Elder. Did the, the banking come up at all uh, when you were working with students? You talked about finances, but did you ever? have any issues around where undocumented people put their money um, or is it like really figuring out those sorts of complexities so that topic we did come with Anna so this is the thing with Anna it's not like I spoke to well Ever since we were connected, that fall of 19, we talk about several issues. And the banking, actually, she's working right now with a dude who does entrepreneurship for undocumented students from UC Santa Cruz. So she has addressed that issue. It's just that I wasn't knowledgeable, but it is important for, for us to open a checking account. And yeah, but you're right, yeah. Are there other questions? Any other questions? I mean, pretty much anything goes. I was wondering, uh, a little while ago, you were uh, someone was discussing the fellowships from uh, Allison Davies and Zillia Doddle. I mean, that's Harvard and Chicago. How did they come to San Jose State? Are they a permanent, ongoing thing? I think that'd be a great question to discuss with Janae afterwards right now. I just want to see if we have any questions oh, okay. for Heather Sorry. about his work. Which actually, that is another issue that Anna is trying to address. Some scholarships, while they might not require for you to be a U.S. citizen, they might ask you to have an IT number, which is how you pay taxes. That's how we pay taxes. We've been doing it for so long. Yeah. But not all undocumented students have an IT number. So she's trying to work around those issues for scholarships. Because in the future, who knows? You might have another undocumented student who qualifies for that. But thanks to that situation, they can get their money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to the question about the implementation, right? You, you, you did all this work and all this stuff. Um, is, a, is somebody going to provide some sort of funding to implement it? I wish it could, but I also talked to Anna today. And the thing is, like, she's the director and her four interns. That means that she has no time to implement this. And she did request in her budget for a program coordinator and increase of staff. That didn't work out. So as of right now, this is on hold. But it's there for her to apply whenever she needs to. I think right now, Anna, as a director, right, you need to think of the systematic as well as the personal. And right now, she's very focused into the systematic. She, I think she's trying to create, or she did, create about eight to 10 positions in partnerships with other student centers on campus and departments to give employment to DACA and non-DACA undocumented students. So I like her approach to that. But again, it's very complicated being a director. I mean, you should know that. <laughs> I just want to add, uh, and I think this is, I'm not an applied anthropologist myself by training, but I know enough of them to know that sometimes you can come up with the best plan and everything ready to go, but implementation is often another question. But for the client, I think the thing is to have something ready in the back pocket when the opportunity comes up so that you can jump on it. And so I think that's really the value of a project like this, even if it hasn't yet been implemented, You've done that hard work of getting, putting all the pieces in place so that it's ready to go when the funding is there. Um, can you use it uh, in other places? Is, is that something that... That's something that really excited me personally about Edward's project when he proposed it to us, was that this is the kind of thing that you could implement across many different kinds mm -hmm. of institutions, mm -hmm. obviously with different kinds of adjustments. Yeah, yeah. But once you get this out there in the world, it gets published, you know, and so on, and through your networks, I think it'll circulate as well. Uh, you know, I think that's where this, this will be headed long term. And the things I was thinking about is how, how a model like that could be implemented on a statewide kind of level, you yeah, know, so, or system wide. Yeah, I mean, I only thought of one year long because that's how we were, you know, we only had one semester, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it also um, uh, kind of goes back to the topic of funding because I thought, and I look like we should give some stipend to, you know, to these uh, mentees so they can remain on the program. But it comes down to funding too because you don't want to promise and then you don't have the money. That looks bad. So, but yeah, I believe that. I, I mean, I do want to work in a four-year college long term, but I don't know right now. I'm too busy trying to graduate. So, <laughs> well, maybe we should end on that note. Uh, yeah, AJ, that way people can mingle a bit before uh, we lose the space uh, at six or whatever it is we need to vacate. Yeah, let's give it up for Adam. Woo